Hey everyone, Nick Apicella here, owner of Resonic Sound Solutions and co-owner of Vanguard Automotive Design. Before we start this video, I just wanted to fill you all in on something new and exciting for Resonix and Vanguard customers. We have a new private support group on Facebook that is dedicated to helping our customers with anything they may need regarding the installation or tuning of the products they purchase through us. This means anytime you may have a question, you can post right in the group and you will get personalized help directly from me regarding the products that you have purchased from us. We are also doing videos and write-ups of various aspects of sound treatment, Helix DSPs, and other installation tips and tricks that anyone in the group can request. This is one of two videos that will be available outside of the private Facebook group. This is also the only place where you may find discount codes for future orders, as Resonix products will never go on sale officially. How to get into the group is simple. Just go to the description of the video below, and you will see a link to the Facebook group. There is one requirement. This group is limited to Resonix and Vanguard customers only who have spent $250 or more with us in the past. When you join the group, you must have your order number or invoice number and type that into the appropriate group membership question. If you request to join the group and you do not enter in an order number, the request will be denied and filtered automatically by Facebook. If you do not have your previous order confirmation emails to obtain your order number, feel free to reach out to me via email or on Facebook directly and we can get that right over to you. Thanks again for everything. I really cannot wait to continue to grow this community together with you. Now, on to our regularly scheduled programming. Hey everybody, Nick from Resonix Sound Solutions here with another tech tip video. This is going to be our first one on the Helix DSP software. Uh, and this one is going to be our initial setup. Um, you know, setting crossovers and setting up the input and output settings. Um, so yeah, we're just going to simulate, you know, a car or, you know, a truck, whatever, an install using a Helix uh, V12 Mark II. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to set up um, a situation where, you know, we're going high level in, we have to do summing, we're also using an input auxiliary card. And I'm just going to show you the different options that we have and how to use them appropriately. Um, so yeah, we're going to be using the new uh, V5 software from Audio Tech Fisher. I'm going to do a Helix V12 uh, DSP Mark II, and I'm going to use, you know, the Bluetooth HD card. Now, before we get into this, I do want to let you know that a lot of these settings and advice going in this video does apply to a lot of these other models that you see here. But there are some features that might be different, might be missing. One of them in particular is going to be the advanced gain, um, the advanced gain menu. Uh, that is only in the V12 and I think the V8, if I remember correctly. Um, it is not in uh, most of these other ones. It might be in the Pro Mark III. I actually haven't used that one yet, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, moving on. So. Again, we're just going to do a demo. We're going to pretend like we have a uh, situation going on here with multiple inputs. So when I first open up the software, you're going to see you're going to get this pop up window every time. This DSP device supports two different processing modes, standard processing and virtual channel processing. Uh, I'm not going to read the rest of this to you. You can do that on your own, but I always use virtual channels 99% uh, of the time. There is probably only one particular situation where I wouldn't use virtual channels. And I guarantee you, you're not going to be in that situation yourself. So I am going to skip over, you know, that part. Uh, I'm going to say select yes, change it to virtual channels, click yes. And immediately, you know, I'm going to just go over what virtual channels is really quick. Uh, the very quick, rough definition is it's pretty much a processor before your processor. Um, now, if I go into the virtual channel tab up here, you can see there's front left full, front right, yada, yada, yada. These are all of our virtual channels. You are unable to change what they're named, but you know they are their own 
channels of processing. You have phase polarity and time. You have levels. You have equalization. You have, you know, various different effects that you could possibly put onto them. Um, so, yeah, processor before your processor is the easy way to understand it. We'll get more into it in a little bit. But first things first, after I turn on virtual channels, I go right into the output section, which is our main area that you work with when you're tuning a car, and I immediately start muting the outputs. Uh, reason for this is just in case I have anything mixed up or you know if the, there's you know some input that's gonna be too loud or I just wanna protect the speakers before I do anything. So you can click over here to mute these or you can just press the hotkeys, um, which is you know the numbers. You can find uh, hotkeys in the manual for the software. We're not gonna go over that in this video. Um, so that's first things first. Second thing I do is I start setting my crossovers to make sure my speakers are going to be protected. So what I'll do here, you know, I will ignore what these are all named, all these channels are named because I know what my channels are. I always do channel A as front left tweeter, 20, uh, front left tweeter, channel B as front right tweeter, and then front left mid range, front right mid range. This is actually correct for how I set it up. Um, this is actually identical to how I set it up. Um, so I don't even need to change these outputs, but some of these models will have, you know, front left high, front left mid, you know, highs, mids, rears, sub, or something of that sort. You know, I ignore what they say and I just focus on, you know, what the actual outputs are. I link the two, you know, link the two tweeters and let's say, you know, I wanna cross map 5,000. By the way, when you are typing in a crossover, you can highlight it type your number and make sure you hit enter in order to actually have that take effect. If I just type a number and I hit tab to go down to the to the slope, it'll just revert back to, you know, 5000. So, as you can see, yeah, you have to hit enter. Whoops. And then you get a tab, go down, use your arrow keys or you can slide it to go to the slope you want. And yeah, and then, you know, I'll keep going. And then. Pretty straightforward, you know. Uh, I'm not gonna bother setting up rears and center and all that, you you get the point. So once I have all my crossovers set up, once I have all my channels muted, what we're gonna do next is go to the input and output menu. Um, now, this is where a lot of new users get confused and ask questions when they initially set this up. Uh, it is a little confusing to someone who is new to this. So the quick basics are, these are your inputs over here, and these are your virtual channels over here. Because I set up virtual channels, I have to set up inputs to virtual channels and then virtual channels to outputs. Um, so how we do that is, again, inputs, you have your analog inputs over here, channels A through L. Uh, we have our auxiliary inputs over here, and we have our digital inputs right down here. Now, how you you know set these up onto your virtual channels is you just drag and drop. It's that simple. If you wanna remove something, you just right click. Uh, pretty straightforward. Now, if you want to sum something, so I have like subwoofer one down here, if I wanted to sum it with subwoofer two to get you know left and right, if I was using like a left and right signal, if I wanted to sum them to get left and right, you just drag and drop it on top and you end up with 50% and 50% of each input. Let's say you had to do some more summing and uh, you know you use your input analyzer, which I'll show you, but I'm not going to go over. Uh, you know, we're in the input analyzer menu. We determine that we need you know more mid-range than tweeter and mid bass. So like if we had to sum, oh, actually, before we even get into that, you know what? Let me actually rename these. How you rename these is you can, double click and you get a little pop-up and you can name it whatever you want. 
let's say these are the mid ranges. And yeah, uh, I'm not going to set this whole thing up again. Not there's not too much point. Um, but yeah, let's just say I'm setting up the left side and I have to sum tweeter, mid range, and mid bass in this particular car. You know, we're going high level after the OEM amplifier and we're trying to get a full range signal. So we already have, I'm just going to get rid of these to make this a little more simple. You know, we're focusing on the virtual channel A, which is our front left. So we're going to build our front left signal right now. Um, let me change this to front left high front left, front right high. So we're going to start with front left high. That's going to get us our high frequencies based on, you know, measuring the signal. Front left mid range, front right, or sorry, front left mid base. Um, now, as you can see, it goes to 33.3% on each one because, you know, we're just summing them without adjusting anything. Um, Again, let's say the mid-range requires more signal than tweeter and mid-bass. You know, maybe that speaker is, you know, the factory speaker is less sensitive, so the manufacturer had to, you know, use, or sorry, it's more sensitive and it had to use less power than the tweeter and mid-bass to get, you know, a flat response. What we can do is double-click and actually adjust the percentage from here based on, you know, whatever we type in. So I can type in 15% of the signal is used from input A. You know, I could click OK. Next thing you know, we have 15%. You know, then let's say front left low is going to be 20%. Remember, these are arbitrary numbers, and it's not what you're actually going to have to do. You're going to have to measure and figure this out. Um, and that leaves us with, you know, already more signal than, you know, the tweeter and mid-bass, but we can actually add. We have 31.7% left. We can do, you know, 40, you know, we can do up to 65% of the signal being the mid-range. Now, let's say they used 12 dB slopes where we know are gonna result in, you know, a phase cancellation. Um, actually, they would probably flip the polarity, but sometimes they don't. I've run into situations where, you know, they use 12 dB slopes and they don't correct the polarity or they don't correct the phase by flipping polarity on one of them, usually the mid-range. Uh, we can, go in here and invert polarity of, you know, each one or however we want, you know, minus 65, minus 25, minus whatever we really put in. It doesn't mean that it's, you know, not using this signal. It just means it's out of phase in this much. So, yeah. So we can build, you know, our right side now. I'm not going to go over and change the percentages, but, you know, from here, we're building our front right signal, virtual channel B. And now... Let's say we're using subwoofer one, we can use for, you know, subwoofer one and subwoofer two, going to subwoofer two. Um, and yeah, let's just, let's just stick with this. Um, now from here, this is our analog input, our main input. On your main input, you can actually use auxiliary, you can use digital, you can actually sum them as well. It's actually pretty, uh, pretty neat. You can use digital inputs, analog inputs, uh, auxiliary inputs on any given, you know, virtual channel. Uh, pretty cool, in my opinion. I don't know any other processors that uh, really allow that. But um, <clears throat> yeah, but let's say we're doing, you know, a car where we're using the high level signal from after the factory amplifier. We're using uh, Bluetooth, one of their Bluetooth cards. So we're using an auxiliary input as well. And then we're also running like a digital audio player and we're running, you know, optical in. So we have our main to virtual routing, which is what we're just setting up. Then we have our auxiliary to virtual routing. Then we have our digital to virtual routing. Then we have our digital output routing. This I'm not going to go over right now um, because this is again, a very rare case where you'll be using this. Um, and then we also have our virtual to output routing. Um, before we get to virtual to output, let me just show you the auxiliary and digital. In auxiliary and digital, it comes pre, you know, as you saw, pre-filled. You're pretty much never going to need to touch it from what it is because it's very simple left and right signal. It's already correct, you know. Um, but as you can see on the 
auxiliary input, you can only use the auxiliary input. Um, just like on main, you don't have the option to use all of them. So if you do want to do something, you know, fancy or interesting or tricky that you have to get around, it has to be done on the main to virtual routing. Uh, same thing with the digital. You can only use the digital input. Uh, again, you can sum, you can sum, you can flip polarity, you can do, you know, different percentages, you can do, you know, same thing, it, it, it all applies. Um, now, virtual to output routing. So again, we have been building our virtual channels in here. Let's just focus on front left, front right, and subwoofers. Now we're going to go to our virtual to outputs. And you'll see this is where our virtual inputs are. These are the ones we just built right here. And then here are our outputs. We have amp output A, B, all the way down to N. Um, and here is where you can actually name your outputs. You know, front left high, front right high, um, you know, center. You, you have this whole list of different output possibilities here that you can select and you know however you set yours up you can change it to whatever you really want um, now as you see here i just changed it to something different you will get a little window that comes up that asks you if you want to load a preset for this type of speaker what it'll do is it will change the crossovers to what is typical for a speaker in this situation personally I don't do this. I, I click no, and I also click remember my choice so this doesn't come up again. So, yeah. Um, so how you go from here is, yeah, you, you know, I'm right-clicking these to remove them. You just drag and drop, you know, front left full to our, let's go back to, you know, front left uh, full range signal to our front left tweeter, front right full range signal to our front right tweeter, front left full range signal to our left mid range and so on and so forth. Um, pretty straightforward once you get the grasp of it. Um, now, there is one other thing in here that I wanna show you is you have your source level adjustments for each different input type. Let's say, you know, your Bluetooth is louder than the you know, are actually quieter than the main, the main input, the analog input. You know, I can go into the main and come up here and drop the signal by like, you know, whatever I want, minus five, minus 10, it goes from minus 10 to positive 10. Now, before you start going and boosting these to, you know, plus 10, you have to verify that, you know, your signal is okay to do that. You know, make sure you're not clipping the signal, clipping an input, clipping the virtual channels. Um, again, that is a different video. We're not going to go over that right now. I'm just showing you what is possible. And you can set this for each and every one. You know, you can set different gains for each input. Now you'll also see, um, you know what, before I, let me click this. Oh yeah, that was exactly what I thought it was. Um, over here, you will see there is off slash manual mode via remote control. And you're gonna wonder what the hell is that? This is how you set up source switching in your processor. With these processors, we can automatically switch which source is playing without touching a button, depending on how you set it up. Now we can click this, or I'll show you how to get there manually. Uh, you hit DCM. Then you come right to this signal management tab right here. Usually it'll be on extended features at first, but you know, click the signal management tab, it'll bring you here. You'll see we have your auxiliary, your hex cards and auxiliary input. We have our main input and we have our digital input. Uh, from here, we have sensitivity and release time. And then we also have a few different options. For main, we have global priority. If you enable this, what this will do is, you know, let's say in a situation where, you know, we have three different input types and let's say you're on a road trip and you're using your digital, uh, digital audio player to get the best quality possible to play your music on this eight hour drive. But you also want to use your navigation and get voice alerts. 
you can select enabled on global priority because what you could do is you could turn the radio um, like radio off or whatever so it's not playing any music but if you have this enabled as soon as signal is sensed on this input it will immediately switch over to the main input so if you have like a voice prompt that comes up from navigation saying turn left in you know one mile you won't miss it just you know because it didn't switch over and you were using your digital input you can have this enabled and it'll immediately switch over give you that voice alert or for you know phone calls or you know parking detection um you know it can switch over automatically immediately if you have this disabled um you won't have automatic switching um in this case we're going to enable it um we also have you know and this priority applies to all of these the only other one i really want to go over before i get into this other stuff is the uh auxiliary input um selection you can either use your heck card you know their heck bluetooth or heck usb or digital or whatever whatever you selected most common is bluetooth and usb um but you know that'll be selected automatically but let's say you want to use you know um an analog input as your auxiliary you can actually use the last two analog low level inputs as your auxiliary source if you select this and if I select that, you'll see, you know, even though we're on auxiliary and only this is enabled, these inputs will now become the last two, um, the last two low level, line level inputs, not the high level. Um, as you can, so the V12 has 12 high level inputs, but it only has eight low level inputs. So it'll be using, uh, or maybe does it have six? Let me, uh. I don't remember exactly, but yeah, line input E and F is the auxiliary source. So it'll be, yeah, E and F. So it has six inputs. The last two line level inputs can be used as an auxiliary source. And if you have that select and you drag and drop, you know, auxiliary left and auxiliary right, it'll use these two inputs. You know, it won't visually show it, but that's what it will do. Um... Now, from there, <clears throat> we have, you know, another option. Do we want it to turn on this input and activate it automatically, or we do, do we want to do it manually? Almost always, people want it set up automatically. So we're going to set automatically, and we can set automatically. Um, now, between the digital and the auxiliary, you can determine which one has priority over the other. 99% of the time in these exact situations like I'm talking about, most customers want that digital input as priority because, you know, for whatever reason, let's just roll, roll with it. We'll select digital input has priority. And then, you know, from there, we can set, you know, release times and sensitivity in relation to our main input. So if we want to be able to trigger playing from digital but turning on the main input we can say okay minus you know minus 50 db of signal is what is required to activate this input so or it could be you know minus 10 db or 0 db or whatever um you know if you want it to be very sensitive to activate this input you can put it down very low. If you want it to be not as sensitive, you put it up. You know, it really just depends on how you want it to turn on. And every car is going to be different. Every setup is going to be different. Um, and same thing, if you want it to, you know, relate to uh, between Bluetooth and digital, again, whatever one you find more important, you can determine based on, uh, you know, what has the higher sensitivity or lower sensitivity, you know. Um, now before I get into the gain, I want to show you if you have it selected off manually via remote control, what you'll have to do is you'll have to have a helix conductor or a helix director. By the way, for the record, I 100% prefer the conductor. It's much smaller, much more, uh, ergonomic, you know, aesthetically pleasing, fits into cars easier, doesn't have as many problems as the director. Um, 
you know, you're going to have to go into your extended features. Uh, you know, let's say our conductor is already on and we're going to go under our conductor menu and we're going to have to activate the input signal selection menu. Or if it's a director, you know, you're going to have to just do it on the director. But yeah, if you want to control the inputs manually, you need to make sure you have this selected. Um, now back to signal management. Now, one more thing I want to show you guys is input selection and input gain. You know, you don't on, on these, the V12 Mark II and on the V8 Mark II, you do not need to use the gain knob on the body of the amplifier. You can actually select using it via software by selecting advanced gain. Um, let's just go back to standard gain setup. Um, you can select high level or you can select RCA. Uh, actually, let me back up a second. You actually, even in standard gain setup, you can still control input gain uh, via software and not have to touch the uh, knob on the you know side panel of the amplifier. Um, and how you'll do that, let's say we're going high level in again, we have our high level selected and then we're going to just select, you know, our sensitivity. Uh, you know, if it's a four volt um, signal, we're obviously going to have to turn up that high level all the way up to four volts. But if it's, you know, 16 volts, we're going to have to, you know, bring the gain down. Now, heads up, the V8 and V12 and some of the other processors like the Ultra and the Pro Mark III are capable of higher voltage inputs than this but that is a hardware selection. You have to open up the hardware and swap the jumpers. If you do not do that, you will fry your inputs if you have a input voltage that is higher than 16 volts. So full disclaimer, you know, make sure you measure your signal before you go about, you know, actually setting this up. That is part of the process and it is required. Um, you can get lucky and just not not do it and you know, oh cool I have a car that doesn't have too high a voltage, but you know, frankly if you fry your input That is not a warranty claim. That is ignorance and willful damage to your product um, So yeah, that is your disclaimer if you've seen this video don't do that measure your voltage on your input signal anyways moving on you can also select RCA and go anywhere from four volts to one volt. But if you wanted to do advanced gain where you can have more control, um, actually, let me back up real quick. How you'll know what, um, what exact gain setting to use is you can play, you know, make sure you have your outputs muted for this like I do. Um, what you can do is play a zero dB signal and, you know, or very loud music, you know, like a song that you know has zero dB bass lines in it, like a lot of rap music will. Um, you can adjust the, whoops, you can adjust the voltage setting of the gain until this little thing lights up red. Once it lights up red, you're going to back it down one and you'll hopefully see that it no longer lights up red. That lighting up red means you are clipping the inputs, which is very bad. You do not want to do any sort of gain overlap on your inputs. Gain overlap is only for your outputs. Uh, so make sure no clipping is possible on your inputs. Make sure no matter what, this is not lighting up. Now, moving on to advanced gain setup. Click that, click advanced gain setup, and now you can actually adjust digitally the gain of each um, you know, each input, if you deactivate the gain structure link, you can actually make sure, oh, A and B, we want more gain, you know, than everything else. Let's say those are tweeters. And, you know, in this case, there's a lot, not a lot of voltage, you know, you, you can boost it up a bit. And, you know, this is what you end up with. Then you can actually activate that link again. Oh, it actually resets them. Uh, I didn't know that. I don't really use this often, to be honest. But um, yeah, you can do different voltages on pairs of inputs. That being said, I've actually never had to do that. Um, what I usually use this for is actually the input level bar, and you can actually see where the input is relative to where you are setting the, uh, the gain. I just keep this active, uh, activated and you know do all of my leveling inside of here, you know where, where we have different percentages. That 
you know, this would allow not having to use different percentages, um, you know, on those inputs. I just prefer to do manual percentages personally. Um, if you click this solo one, it actually mutes these inputs and allows you to play just that one input. So you can monitor that input only on the input level bar. You could also mute all the outputs just so you know, you know, everything is protected. Um, I already did it manually. Let me actually, for the sake of the video, if I unmute this, let me see. All right. Thankfully it still leaves them muted because I muted them manually before. Um, but yeah, that's something you want to take note of. Um, I think that covers it from here. Uh, yeah. Next, hopefully I can show you how to use, you know, the input signal analyzer and maybe, you know, more of the virtual channels or the conductor setup um, or any of these other features. Actually, you know what? Let's go into some of these other features really quick while we're here. ACO features uh, is your turn on and turn off delay. You know, frankly, usually you don't really need this, but you know, if you want turn on delay to get rid of any pop or whatever there might be, you can, you know, set turn on and turn off delay right here. If you're still using a URC3 instead of a conductor, you can, you know, determine what LEDs mean what, and then you can, um, turn on and off the remote output when it, while it's switching presets. You know, very few selections in here. Uh, virtual channel processing, this is just where you turn on and off virtual channels. By the way, once you turn them on, you cannot turn them off. You have to wipe the tune and start fresh uh, or just start a new tune. Um, device monitor, again, only some models have this where you can measure, you know, temperature, voltage um, over periods of time which is pretty neat in my opinion. Um, and then the PC tool configuration is just where you have different settings for the software itself. You know, you have RTA window mode. We're not going to get into this perf, but just a heads up for those of you that already know how to use the RTA in the software. I prefer windowed over embedded uh, personally because I'm using a laptop and the screen isn't huge. So I can have separate windows. EQ link mode. Uh, relative, it comes default on relative and you should be leaving it on relative. This is another powerful, um, feature of the Helix that puts it above the, you know, most processors. Um, some are starting to catch up, but this was a neat little feature that, uh, separated them from the rest early on. Uh, EQ view mode. This is where you have, you know, normal point or drag and touch. Normal is going to look like this, you know, you know, let me just go to something that is full range you know, where it just looks normal. If we have point, it's going to be a bunch of different dots. Uh, let me unmute this so you see it. You know, you'll see there's, whoop, what the heck? Why isn't it? Uh, oh, because you actually can't drag and drop. Uh, the points actually show you, you know, these little dots show you where your, your filter is. So if I actually change this to 600 instead of 630, you'll see it'll shift over that dot. Now, drag and touch. I personally do not use this because my laptop is touchscreen and the way I go about tuning is I I don't I don't like that and I also don't want to accidentally touch my screen touch my screen and ruin some of the EQ. Drag and touch is the same as point, but it allows you to click and actually drag and adjust your filter. You know, you can lower it, raise it, move it left to right, you know. I don't like this enabled. I can see why some people would like it. Um, I just am cautious. I don't wanna accidentally touch my screen and ruin something I already did. Um, that being said, if you do, you can actually go back into the DCM um, and you have to have this feature enabled before you ruin something. If you turn on the time machine, what it does is you'll see this little clock down here. Uh, every, I think it's every 30 seconds or every minute, uh, a little setting will pop up down here and the time will show up, you know, 9.51 will pop up and then 9.52 and then 9.53. Let's say you screw something up so bad, you can actually click a different time and revert to what the tune was when it saved it uh, right there. That being said, it doesn't actually save them in the computer or the software. It just, or 
yeah, or in the processor, sorry. Uh, it doesn't save it in the computer or the processor. It just holds that, holds that setting in the software. And as soon as you close it, these settings that are all backed up disappear. You have to save and store uh, manually. So, uh, you know, so you see time machine, EQ view mode, EQ gain resolu resolution, channel gain resolution, all pass control, uh, and EQ band auto sort. I have this disabled, again, depending on how I go about tuning. I do not like auto sort. I hate it. Um, you, some people benefit from it, but the way I go about tuning, it is not ideal. Um, and then down here, we also have set, uh, setting password protection, meaning, you know, if you set a password here, you won't be able to access the tune without knowing the password and entering the password. For hobbyists, I don't see a reason why you would have this. For shops, um, this is good to have because you can prevent customers from, you know, ruining stuff by being nosy or not even nosy, just thinking they know better than you and, you know, turning those gain knobs all the way to the right. You know, that's just not how it works. So this is a little, um, little bit of protection for you there. Um, so yeah, that pretty much covers this first video. I uh, hope it helps a lot of you out and let me know what you guys want to see next in this software. Thank you and have a good day.